Welcome to the Brute Strength Podcast, bringing you worldwide experts from all areas of health and fitness. We cover training, nutrition, coaching, and mindset. Welcome your host, strength and conditioning coach, 2012 and 2013 CrossFit Games champ, Michael Cashew. Mind, body, brute. Hey, and welcome back. My name is Mike Cashew, and you're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. This week, I'm back on the show with Ben Bergeron. Ben is one of the most successful CrossFit coaches of all time, as well as an entrepreneur. He's coached some of the top athletes in the sport of fitness, such as CrossFit Games champions Matt Fraser and Katrin David's daughter. He and I have become friends over the past couple years, and I've really grown to admire him, and not just for what he's achieved, but more so how he thinks about his own thinking, the way that he leads, and what he stands for. Ben preaches putting character and the whole person before anything else, and that's something that really, really resonates with me. So we base this show mostly on his new book, Chasing Excellence. We talk about his recipe for competitive excellence, how to build character, how to build mental toughness, why training four to six hours per day has nothing to do with hard work, the importance of identifying what's inside and outside of your control, Many people heard about his uh, exercise that he had uh, his athletes do a couple years ago, which was to identify all of the things at the CrossFit Games that could go wrong. And we talk about why he does that and the impact that it can have on your performance. Finally, we talk about the one belief he holds that if you adopt will have the biggest effect on your performance and life in general. Before we get started, if you are a longtime listener of the show and haven't done so already, please head to iTunes and leave me a quick review. If you're new to the show and haven't done so already, head to brutestrengthtraining.com and sign up for the newsletter. That's where we're going to keep you up to date with all of the new episodes, as well as videos and other free content that we're putting out. Enjoy the show. Ben, what's up, brother? Great to be hey. here with you again. Thanks for making some time for me. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, happy to be here. So a couple months ago, your book, Chasing Excellence, hit the Amazon bestseller list, which is an enormous, enormous deal. I don't think people really realize that. This is not, like I think if you're on the New York Times bestseller list, people actually pay to get there. To become an Amazon bestseller, you have to write a phenomenal book that just rapidly grows and and gets a lot of readership so that's a huge accomplishment man congratulations thanks man appreciate it yeah it's uh i when i became like uh, when i started writing a book which is just weird in itself <laughs> i i i dug into some of those like bestseller lists and what it means to get on them because i you know that'd be cool you know I, right. I thought to myself and the new york times one is the one i um the new york times best sell do you know what that means the new york times bestseller list it has nothing is it has zero to do with how many books you've sold. Mm -hmm. Literally zero. And it's literally just a group of guys that say, We like your book. Right. And that's really how you get on. It's it's it has and um the guy that wrote The Exorcist, which was sold millions of copies, didn't get on it because they didn't like his book because it spoke badly about, you know, it's like whatever, religious stuff. Yeah. So he sued them, took them to the Supreme Court. It went to all the way up. And I believe it went all the way up and, um, he lost cause they didn't, they, their claim is like, Hey, we're not selling. It's the most selling. We're saying it's a best selling and best is an arbitrary term that we're using to say mm -hmm. that we like it. Wow. It's crazy. Yeah. And but then, thank you. Yeah. I made, uh, I made different. Amazon. I'm, I'm proud of that. That's really cool. Thanks. That's awesome, man. So I know that both of us are fans of stoic philosophy and mm -hmm. Ryan holiday's book. Ego is the enemy. Mm -hmm. You have achieved just so much over the past couple of years with your athletes, as an entrepreneur, you, you've accomplished so many different things. How do you keep it from going to your head and like just creating mm -hmm. uh, th this enormous ego and staying focused on what it is that you're actually up to? Um, I don't feel like I've, I don't think I've scratched the surface. Like, I think it's the answer. Like I, I've, um. I think it's because I have a lot more, I have a lot I want to do mm -hmm. and I, I, um, I don't think I'm nearly, um, as capable as where I, where I hope I am in a few, you know, 
five or 10 years, I hope I look back at where I am right now and, and laugh at myself. Cause that's what right. I do now. When I look back at myself five years ago, I look back at that Ben and I'm like, <laughs> you didn't know very much back then. Right. And I, I know I'm going to look back at where I am right now and it's going to be the same thing. You know, you are so closely with your wife. You guys are so closely tied to the nutrition field. Like this is nutrition is like, just like, like what we think we know about nutrition, like gets rewritten every four or five years. It's like, we learned so much more. And for me to, um, think that I've accomplished anything or that I know anything is kind of ridiculous. We put in comparison to other people that actually have had a lot more impact and have done a lot more stuff and had a lot more success and know a lot more. So I, I, I think it's a really easy question to answer. Cause it's, uh, I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm there. Right. right. You're not even close. I think there's also an element to like, I know that you're a really competitive person, but I also know that you are, you're clear that happiness is not about achievement. Right. And mm -hmm. I've heard you, I've heard mm -hmm. you talk about it somewhere. It's uh, it is not on the other side of achievement. It is right, right here, right now. We have everything that re that is required to be happy and you, you're not defined by what you achieve. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, the story I kind of tell to back that up is, um, Katrin, um, who's my athlete that I train, um, she won the CrossFit games two years in a row. And when she came off the, the podium, that second time she walked up to me, gave me a big hug and then looked me right in the eye and said like, I'm not as happy as I thought I would be. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just, we see it time and time again is that people put happiness on the other side of their goals on the other side of achievement. And they tell themselves, I'll be happy when dot, 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 when I graduate college, when I get a good job, when I get married, when I get the 2.4 kids and the white picket fence and the two car garage, when I get the ski house, when I get the promotion, when I retire and then what's after, I mean, it's like when I die, like, like it's not on the other side of those things. Happiness has to be had in the here and now. And it's gotta be about the enjoyment of the process of achieving those things. And if we always think it's gonna be somewhere else, it's not because what we do that immediately, you know, it's happened to me. It's like, I want to earn a certain amount of money. And once you do that, it's like, you're not happy. You immediately reassess those goals. You're like, I want to make this much. Mm -hmm. I want to um, do so well in this competition. I want to be in the top 10. Well, once you get in the top 10, literally it's like some people it's instantaneous. Some people might be after a day. It's I want to, I want to be on the podium. Right. I want to win. I want to win again. I want to win by more. It's like, there's never, that's not where happiness lies. And it's what we've it goes against what we've been told through our education system. And what they say is just buckle down, work hard, little Johnny, do well on your test. And if you do well on your test, you'll get into college. If you get in college, you'll get a good job. If you get a good job, you'll marry the right girl. If you marry the right girl, you'll, and they just keep on putting it off. Mm -hmm. And then you retire. And what we're told is retirement is when you're happy. God, I, I, I hope we're not waiting until right. we're 70 to be happy. What I've actually, um, you know, happiness is something I like to I like to talk about. It's the thing I question about myself a lot. And um, I'm not a, you know, my wife and Katrin, who are best friends, and they, you know, they are happy go lucky. Like they giggle and laugh, and everything is constant. Like you know, it, you see them, and you're like, those are two happy people. Mm -hmm. That's not me. That's not who I am. So I've I've kind of like questioned myself a lot. Like I'm setting up my whole life to try to be quote unquote happy, but I don't walk around giggling all the time. Am I happy? And it wasn't until I read, um, Victor Frankl's man's search for meaning that it really put in perspective where you can't search for happiness. It's not something that you strive for. It's like the harder and harder you try to laugh, like you know, the harder you try to laugh, the least, the more, the less likely you are to actually find amusement in something. The more you search for happiness and you look for it everywhere, the less likely you are actually to be happy. What his whole thing is, is fulfillment. Mm -hmm. And when I came across that, it was like the curtains got flung wide open and I am all about, that really resonates with me is I want to live a fulfilled life. Yeah. I want to be able to get to the end of my days, be able to be totally content with the life I've lived and said, did I 
live? Did I learn? Did I lead? Did I leave? Did I love? And did I leave a legacy? You know, did the people that mean to me, did I have impact on their lives? Mm -hmm. And if I can do that, that to me is I am happy. That's a great answer, man. I love that. Do you think that fulfillment, is there, is there anyone that fulfillment doesn't have something to do with serving other people and contributing to other people? That's a good question. Um, I think that people can, uh, find fulfillment in other ways, but to find complete fulfillment with your life in totality, I think that you have to have, um, some sort of like fill in the blank relationships, some sort of love, some sort of compassion, some sort of help, some sort of whatever it is for other people. Mm -hmm. You know, there was that, um, study that Harvard did. Um, and they, they were not trying to find out about relationships or fulfillment or anything like what they were, they were trying to find out, um, about, um, who lived the longest and who lived the most, uh, disease free lives. And what they found was, um, it had little to do with what people were eating, their environmental factors, the genetic factors, their work, their work schedule, uh, their activity levels. It was not constantly very functional movements that kept people going. You know, it, it really kind of flew in the face of what all the researchers were looking for. And what they found was that it was the people that had re really strong relationships. Mm -hmm. The people that had deep, meaningful love and trust in their lives lived the longest and lived the happiest lives uh, compared to anybody else. So can you live a somewhat happy and fulfilled life without that? I don't know, possibly, but I certainly think that it will move the needle, you know, having, having strong relationships. I'm not even going to go into this much because the listeners are probably sick of me bringing this book up, but <laughs> the, uh, have you read Sebastian's younger, Sebastian Younger's tribe? tribe? I, I have not. I, I know about it. I think uh, he quotes the same study that you're talking about, but oh, it basically really? there's just, a Ted talk on it. I saw it through a Ted talk. Yeah. Gotcha. It basically just says our, our brains evolved to crave being in a community and contributing to others because 10,000 years ago, I couldn't survive without you. And vice yeah, versa. Right. Right? It's the campfire and the leader, the chief, and you have to lean on each other to, you know, um, I was just listening to something by Seth Godin, which is really cool too. And it's like, this is where fear comes from. Fear is, um, two things really. Fear is, um, stemmed from like when you hear a, uh, a twig snap in the woods and you go, what was that? And it might be a saber tooth tiger. So you need that fear, right? That is, you standing on top of a 70 foot cliff and all your buddies are at the bottom saying like, jump, you know, you go cliff diving with your buddies, jump, jump. And you're like, your knees are shaking. That's a real fear because there is like imminent danger. Like you might get hurt. You might get attacked or you might do physical damage to yourself. You stepping up to a barbell that weighs a lot. That's a real fear. Like you're going to snatch and throw that thing above your head with 300 pounds. Like mm -hmm. that's, there's, there's a potential for danger there. The other fear though Fear of public speaking, fear of public ridicule, fear of what the person's saying about you on social media, fear of um, not being accepted. What that comes from is back in the evolutionary days is us sitting around the campfire and someone being like, you don't belong with us. Get out and you die Dead. because you need the tribe to survive. Or the chief saying like, you're a threat to me. Get out and you're and you die. So those fears though don't – work in today's society. They're still built into our DNA, but being loud, having an opinion, being different than the crowd, standing out, these are all now advantageous things for us right. as individuals, as athletes, as people trying to create a brand, as whatever it is, as companies. Yet it's it goes against our entire DNA, which has evolved through us through this whole thing of be safe, be quiet, do your job, be a part of the pack, don't get ostracized. How do you how do you recommend people counteract that DNA that and go against that DNA? Recognize what it is. Mm -hmm. It's false. It's never going to go away. So people are like uh fear isn't real. No fear. Like just go off, you know, just like it's it, 
it's no, it is super real. It's real. It's as real as hunger. Like it's real, but it's false. Yeah. It's, it's, it doesn't control. It doesn't, it shouldn't dictate the way we live in our society today. It is a protective mechanism for a previous human species that we've evolved past. Right. And that recognition of it is powerful. When you realize it, there it is. There's the sweaty palms. There's the increased heart rate. There's the nerves. I'm going to get in front of this crowd. And that's why I'm nervous. I get it. Like I'm going to do a presentation to 50 strangers. I understand why I'm nervous, but I also understand this isn't real. This is not why there's no reason to be nervous here. And I can also do what I've practiced and do what I'm capable yeah. of doing. So that's the that flip feeling. side of it is um, you can you can falsely pump yourself up and be like, I'm going to nail this. I'm going to crush this and fake confidence. Mm -hmm. That's just fake confidence. What you have to do if you really want to get past that fear is practice, train, get really good at your craft. Right. You know, if you want to just like false, you know, promises to yourself, you're going to crash and burn. And the next time you're going to be even more nervous. Yep. The best way for to be confident is be prepared. So I really want to dive into your book, but first Matt O'Keefe said, I have to ask you about okay. your annual contraction of rhabdo before every CrossFit games. What's the story <laughs> behind that? That's Matt that gets that. <laughs> I don't we, know uh, that. we, we, we go to, when we go to the CrossFit games, there's, uh, you know, the days leading up to that is there's so much downtime. Mm -hmm. It's just like ridiculous. Like, um, the athletes have to go to athlete dinners and athlete registration. But besides that, the athletes are tapering. So they're going and getting their sweat on, you know, for a very short period of time at a gym. And Matt and I, who's, um, you know, Matt is the, um, the agent of a lot of CrossFit athletes and we have a little, um, so we go and work out and I'm never not busy. So like, this is my chance to like go and do what I love to do, which is train and work out. So we can go and do that for a lot longer and harder than what we normally do. So nice. we sometimes tip the needle a little You're too right, far. Yeah. Walking around with your, your arms bent all weekend. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And of course there's beach and swole sessions to it. Cause of course. Cross, you want to look good, you know, of course, man. Yeah. You got to be the fittest yeah. coach in the world as well. Hey, you know, <laughs> look good, feel good, perform good. That's right, man. Okay, so your book starts out with a chapter on commitment, and you talk a lot about, whether it be in the book or, or on social media, you talk a lot about building the character, building people's character mm -hmm. or the person first. And I've heard you say that you're not doing this to make the world a better place so that it, you know people right. are out there helping others. You do this because it's a competitive advantage. How is that? Um. So my, my theory about the way to, to build an elite athlete, um, or to build as, as a, anything really as an employee, as anything, if I'm going to try and build someone to thrive, I'm going to start with their character and their character traits and things like, um, coachability, things like humility, things like hunger, drive, commitment, fortitude, dedication, uh, patience, passion, persistent, like all, whatever, like fill in the blank, all the, all the positive character traits that you would put into like the ideal teammates, right? Um, the reason I do those things is yes, I want the world to be a better place in those things. But if it was just because of those, I, I wouldn't do them unless I believe they were truly a competitive advantage for us. If it was, if I wanted, if I ask my athletes to make their bed in the morning when they're staying at someone else's house, and I do, that's not because I, I want them to have good manners. It, if I ask them not to complain or um, use their phones when we're at dinner together, that's not because I want them to, you know, be better in job interviews or be better, you know, fathers later on in life. That's because I believe those things carry over to the everyday grit and grind that is the CrossFit training season. If you create Commitments, dedication, all those things outside the walls of the gym, they can't help but manifest themselves inside the gym. Right. And if I ask my athletes to um, um, have a commitment to a certain process, a nightly routine, well, that's going to that's gonna build mental toughness. And that toughness is going to come up and 
be an advantage for us later on, either in training or in competition. It's not for the simple sake of, you know, the, the New Zealand All Blacks, most dominant rugby team ever, says better people make better All Blacks. And they know the same thing I do, which is it's true, but it's not because we're more polite and we have better, you know, manners. It's because we know when a push comes to shove, we'll have the right character traits in place to fight through this adversity, to work harder, to be the underdog, to be the favorite, and to be uh, the long shot, and to know how to overcome all of those odds. Mm -hmm. I love the concept that your mindset in one area of your life is the mindset you take in every area of your life. And that seems to be something that you really, really drill into your athletes. I think when a lot of people hear you and I talk about this kind of thing, it really just goes over their head and they don't, they, they just don't see the value in it. Uh, you're working with a lot of young athletes that, you know, it, whether, whether or not they have, they haven't had a lot of life experience or they're, they're just young in general, how do you get them to really understand this concept and, and how are you so effective in building their character? Um, I'd like to be more effective mm -hmm. first off, like I, everything I do, you know, I want to, I want to be better at it. So I'm not, um, I'm, I'm definitely not great at this. Um, I, I've been doing it for, you know, 10 years. So hopefully I've learned something along the way. Um, I think that the, the, I can't get them to buy in right away on it. It's just like, it's not going to, right? So the way that we, I just constantly talk about it all the time. Right. And it's repetition, repetition, repetition. This is what we're about. This is what we stand for. This is how we're going to compete. This is how we're going to practice. This is how we're going to live our lives. This is who we are. This is our character traits. This is our core values as a team. This is what we stand for as individuals. This is what it means. And this is how we're going to act in the gym. This is how we're going to act at the dinner table. This is how we're going to act when we're on camera. This is how we're going to act. We're on the competition floor. When these scenarios present themselves, this is who we are. And then by th that virtue, if it's that constant repetition, it's <laughs> hopefully starts to sink in a little bit and manifest itself in this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. Right. So I've heard you describe confidence as, and I'm kind of paraphrasing here, the ability to maintain the characteristics of a champion, regardless of what life throws at you. And I've mm -hmm. heard Michael Gervais of the Seahawks say that all of his work, and he's a sports psych of the Seahawks, as well as some of the biggest CEOs in the world, all of his work starts with A, starting to know yourself. Right. And mm -hmm. then once you once you know yourself, cultivating the ability to maintain you, who you are and be yourself in the most rugged circumstances. What do you what do you mo it sounds like you're both saying similar things. What do you both mean by this? So that definition you gave, that's that's actually my definition of mental toughness. Um, not of confidence. Okay. So to me, mental toughness is the ability to stick dedicated to the process regardless, regard, regardless of what's being thrown at you. So you have a way of doing things and you have a best practice. And regardless of it being um, 120 degrees and we're doing Murph and weight vests or it's freezing cold and it's raining and you have to swim or you're in last place and um, everyone else has already finished, regardless of what's going on, you are 30 points out of contention and it's the last workout and you know, you're not going to win. How are you still going to compete? And that is, that is my definition of mental toughness. I think a lot of people see mental toughness and what they define it as is the same definition of toughness. It's being able to withstand pain. And that's not what that is. You know, that's to me is the heart of what we need to get at for everything. Once we have mental toughness in place and why just stop like, why, why wait till the competition to talk about it? I think that's what most people are doing is they wait till they get to the games. They wait till they get to the event. They wait till they get to the open workout. And then they're like, time to be tough, time to grit time and to grind. And when it gets, yeah, the time to like, when it, when it hurts, like you got to go and like, okay, first off, we should be building that every single day. Mm -hmm. And then from there, it's not, it's not just about 
the physical toughness of pushing through that last round, picking up that barbell when your heart's beating, you know, at 190 beats a minute. It's about how are you acting when the judge gives you six no reps in a row and you don't know why. That's mental toughness. The amateurs and the people that aren't mentally tough react to that and they react emotionally. They react um, with a hormonal response. They react with short-term impulses. They react the way that we want them to, we, the way that they want to, whereas the pros, the people with mental toughness, don't react at all. They respond. And responses are calculated. They're thought out. They're, um, there's a level of pride that comes with them because they're going to look back and be like, I'm glad I responded in that way. Where reactions are, there's usually regret tied to it. Like, mm-hmm. I can't believe I did that. I sat there and argued with my judge for 25 seconds when the clock was ticking, but I should have just done another rep or whatever. There's a level of composure that comes along with mental toughness. And if you look at, you know, some of the guys that Mike Gervais works with, you know, and Russell Wilson, like competitiveness, toughness, um, like a never quit a, he's going to be able to, you know, Russell Wilson's going to be able to look back at that game when they were down by 37, you know, whatever it is, they're down by 20 points in the fourth quarter. And this happened with the green Bay Packers and the NFC championship when they're down by 17 points in the fourth quarter. If he lets up on the throttle, he's going to look back at that either minutes after the game or week after the game. He's like, I should have just done everything I could. Mm-hmm. Well, champions have hindsight in the present moment and they know they should just go and give everything they have regardless of what's going on. And if it doesn't work out at the end, it doesn't work out at the end, but they can still look themselves in the mirror and say, I'm so happy with the effort and the approach I took to that scenario. That to me is what mental toughness is. One of, so you're talking about reaction versus responding. And one of the things that that takes is a, an extreme level of awareness. Mm-hmm. So I've, I've heard you talk about some of the things that you do with your athletes to help them build awareness of who they are and what matters yeah. to them, right? You have yep. them write down their core values, their mission statement, other things like this. One thing that I think is really, really interesting is that you have them then share their mission statement, their core values with the people in their life. Why is that important? Um, I, as you said, like I think when people get to know themselves, um, it's one of the, if you wanna achieve a goal, but you don't see yourself as a type of person that can achieve that goal, you're not gonna achieve it. If you wanna achieve a goal and you see yourself as the type of person that will do whatever is necessary to make that happen, you're way more likely to succeed. So if I want to run a sub three hour marathon, but I don't see myself as the type of person that, you know, likes to run, that is super dedicated. And um, when the weather gets tough, I'm probably going to sandbag it. Like I'm never going to run a sub three hour marathon. If I'm the type of person if I see myself as the type of person that regardless of the circumstances, I never, ever miss a running workout ever. Like that's just not what I do. Like I'm, I'm the chances of me doing pretty well in that marathon and go way, way up. Right. It's really impactful for people to know who they are, what they stand for, what are their core values? What is their personal mission statement? Um, who do they identify themselves as, as a person? What are their bright lines? What are their trenches that they, I am the type of person that dot, 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 never hits the snooze alarm, doesn't complain, never misses a workout, choose the salad over the cheeseburger, whatever it is, right? When you create those bright lines, it's really easy for you to make the right decisions and it's all about making the right decisions. That's what this whole life is we're about. If you make the right decisions back to back to back to back to back or Maybe there is no right decisions. Better decisions that are in line with the trajectory of your goals, you're more achieve, likely to achieve just those. From there, if you then vocalize those to other people, there's a saying that you are not what you think you are. You are not what other people think you are. You are what you think other people think you are. Boom. So – if you put that out to the world and then other people are like, oh, Ben's the type of person that never misses a workout. Mm-hmm. And then you start hearing people say that, then all of a sudden you never miss a workout. 
If you go to a, um, a birthday party and people are passing around the cake and someone's like, don't even hand it to Ben because he doesn't eat birthday cake. Guess what? It's really easy for you to pass on that cake. It's like you are what you think other people think you are. And all you have to do is what do you want to be? Who do you want to be? Project that out to the world. Tell the other world, tell that people, this is who I am. They start thinking that. You start thinking that that's what they think of you. And there you have it. Yeah, I, I think this is this is one of the biggest things that people don't realize in their in their life and their performance in general. I'm I'm personally huge on like taking accountability for myself and I've always been extremely independent and just wanting to again, just wanting to take care of my own shit. I didn't realize how until recently how important my environment is, right? And the people in it the, they make up my environment. So you can be the most like you can be the most strong-willed driven person in the world, but if everyone around you thinks you're a piece of yeah. shit and not reliable and they don't hold they don't help hold you accountable, then you're you're going to be limited. When you enroll people in the vision that you set for yourself, you are 10 times more likely to reach that vision. Imagine, imagine this scenario and we, we've, uh, the reason I'm going to use this is because we just had it. So we had a guy that was following our training program and, um, he was following it letter to the law, like just like to a T, um, didn't, you know, he saw some gains, didn't see much, didn't really move the needle that much for himself as an athlete. He came and he was like, I I'm missing something. He came and moved and started training with us at CrossFit New England. I don't coach him. Like no one coaches. Him. He's just he's just training with us, and be, but because he's immersed himself in that culture, mm -hmm. he's. I mean, he's he is a one hundred percent different athlete than he was before because he's immersed himself in that same culture where other people are supporting him. There are people there that are better than him, so there's something to aspire to. There is if you're doing this thing on your own by yourself, it's a long. It's not impossible at all. At all, you can do it. There are stories of a lot of world-class performers that are have done this thing on their own. It's just, it's a lot harder to climb that mountain than it is to get in a car with a bunch of other people with the same goals and vision and go up it together. Right. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the adage, you are the five, uh, you are right. the, the average, average of the, the five, five people you spend the most time with. That's so popularized now. And the, like what people believe about you is why that's so important. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and, and again, getting them on board with whatever you're going for and, and getting them to push you and support you is extremely important. Yeah. I mean, my, you know, like you don't have to go out and say like, I'm going to win the CrossFit games, but go and tell people how important this part of your life, this is to your life. Yep. You know, that type of thing. Don't, you don't have to set like, um, cause then people, are, if you say like, I'm going to go out and win the CrossFit games. You get a lot of like, okay, whatever. Or like, do you know how much work that takes? Do you know like, it, it, just it's hard telling people how important this is in your life. Like me competing at my best and me training for four to six hours every single day is who I am. This is what I do. And I'm not going to be happy. I'm not going to be fulfilled unless I do those things. And then people like start, it's a lot easier to accept that as a third party this is what Mike needs to do. Mike needs to go and he needs to work. If he doesn't work out four hours a day, he's not going to be happy. I have friends that like, you know, have worked it into their, their marriage. Like, honey, I'm not happy. I am not going to be a good husband to be around unless I get the week skiing in Utah every year. I right. need that as a, per like, okay. Like I get that. Like he needs this to do, be happy. Like, Put it out to the world. Like, let people know what it is that you're looking for and striving for. Yeah, and I think it. Yeah, it definitely. I need to do that. By the way, be... I need to. I need to tell my wife that I'm not gonna be happy unless I'm skiing out west for a week. <laughs> like that, man. I think it. I don't think it has to be an outcome at all. I think it can be just like this is the type of person I want to be. So one thing you're, <laughs> right. you're really big on is not complaining, staying positive, right? Enrolling people in that and having them call you out when you're when you're not being the type of person you want to be, that's like very high leverage stuff at the base of your pyramid that's going to just 
naturally trickle up to the to you know your skill level your abilities um, your ability to perform in every area of your life so getting them to hold you accountable to the type of person that you want to be is super important spot on absolutely so your your opening chapter is on commitment and commitment to the process so for yourself personally as a father husband coach entrepreneur how did you come to discover this part of uh your whole the just what you teach was there an event a conversation or just a series yeah. of events that led to you committing to this path of excellence um so yeah so i, I like most coaches um i started off with uh the x's and o's i started off with strategy you know in our world in crossfit it's let's uh let's go singles here quick singles or let's go three sets of five or let's go uh let's try to go unbroken and let's try to uh you know all that type of stuff strategy and then it was um trying to create ability let's get you faster stronger let's work on um this linear progression let's work on whatever it is and that's kind of where i stopped for most of it but when i trained a team it was very different when I trained my team to compete at the CrossFit Games, it was the personalities. It was the dedication to the, the, the team effort. It was all the stuff that you do in team building stuff. It was about how, you know, we're five individuals, but the fist is stronger, stronger than five fingers, all that. It was like I worked really hard to create um, the character traits I wanted on a team because I knew – how important that was. And the examples are everywhere where uh, less talented teams beat more talented right. um, teams that don't function as well. And when I saw, uh, I didn't really have the carryover into how those character development would affect individuals until I started training Katrin and she lived with us. And when she lived with us, she couldn't get away from that all the stuff, all the character development stuff and the personality stuff. And, um, and when I started, when she was living with us, it was, I was constantly giving her feedback on what we're looking for. And when she moved with us, she was an immature, young, emotional girl, period. You look at her now and she's like, a, like a fortress, like yep. a, like a, a, just a, a beast of a human being, the most mentally tough athlete I've ever been around. So that transformation would not have happened if she didn't live with us because I would have coached her with the X's and O's. I would have coached her with let's get you better thrusters and better muscle ups. And I never would have gone and dug into the process of what does it look like to be a better human being. But I talked to her about making the bed. I talked to her about cleaning up after herself. I talked to her about complaining. I talked to her about growth mindset. I talked to her about passion and dedication. I talked to her about what it looks like to work through and towards a goal. And that's when things are, when I saw like the, what, the effect that happened, mm -hmm. all of a sudden I shift a lot of my focus away from thrusters and pull-ups and running faster and getting better 2k row times to let's focus on the right character traits. And now that's what I start my development with my athletes. You know, I was coaching Chris Spieler and Becca Voigt, when I was doing individual athletes back then, I wasn't that kind of a coach at all. I didn't coach that way. It was all about programming and strategy. But I've just seen what it, what the character development does. You can achieve so much more when you get the base of the pyramid bigger. And do you feel like you have implemented the same the same things you're you're discovering and teaching to Katrin and the rest of your athletes you're discovering for yourself personally and implementing in your own life as a again like a father a, a entrepreneur all of those things yeah so i'm constantly trying to dig in and self assess, assess myself so all the things that my athletes do i'm <clears throat> as you are i'm i'm very self analytical um i i hold myself to you know <clears throat> some really high standards what I've done is I've I've created myself a mission statement for myself and so I want to live a fulfilled life where at the end of my days I can say to myself, did I live, love, learn, lead and leave a legacy? And what I've done is I've categorized those five different categories of love, lead, all those L's and I've created five measurables for each of those. And 
for each of those measurables every single day, I track myself on how I'm doing with those five different things. So I have 25 checkpoints every single day to make sure I'm living a fulfilled life today in the moment now. Not when I'm retired, I'll look back and be like, did I do it? I know right now if I'm doing it or not. Mm -hmm. And not every day is perfect and a lot of days are far, far from perfect. And I'm not able to check in every day, but I am well above you know, that 80% spectrum and hopefully it's that 80-20 rule where I'm doing a, 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 a good job. So where I do get to that end of my days and I can look back and I can say, I did it. My biggest fear though is I look back at that and I'm like, I wish I hadn't spent so much time doing this. I wish I had done that. What I want to be doing is constantly in the moment and it's really what I spend. I mean, I think a big thing for people to think about is like, is what do you think about? When you're driving in the car and you don't have the radio on or you're, you know, sitting somewhere, you're not engrossed in social media. When you're in the shower, like what are the things going through your head? That's what's really important to you in my mind. And if you're thinking about what that person said to you on social media, you might need some self reevaluation, you know, like let's, let's try to look a little bit deeper into what really meaningful, impactful in our lives and get some perspective and some distance on this whole thing. And I'm, I'm hoping that what I'm doing, and I, I, I won't know, but what I'm hoping I'm doing is that I'm setting myself up so that every single day I know I'm checking the boxes that I should be checking to say, this is what a fulfilled life looks for me now. And I'm not going to get caught up in any one thing, which is so easy to do, to go chase those bright, shiny objects. Mm -hmm. And I hear it all the time from like, you know, people say like, if you want to be a world class in something, there is no balance. I agree with that. I don't want to be world class in something. I want the balance. Right. To me, balance is the way I'm going to find that fulfillment. I want to have a really good family life. I want to excel in my business. I want to be a really good coach. I want to have really meaningful relationships in my life. I want to learn and grow and achieve my goals. And I'm not willing to give up any one of those areas for any other. And I think what people do is they justify it. They say, I'm going to work my ass off really, really, really hard. I'm going to dedicate 120 hours a week to pounding on my craft and creating this business. And then I'll be able to kick it with my family. Right. Well, guess what happens? Things happen in those, in those three years where you're busting your ass, where you are shattering things that are irreparable and you're not going to be able to come back to it. And I've seen this firsthand with a lot of people I know that are, incredibly hard workers that are so goal oriented, but then they get to that spot where they're supposed to be happy and fulfilled and they're not. And that's what I'm, that's my worst fear. And that's where I want to make sure today I'm living a fulfilled life. And if I can do that along the way by self-actualization, asking myself the right questions and, um, making sure I'm, I'm steering myself constantly and readjusting those 25 things are movable things. Those shift and change. Um, every quarter, I reassess them. Um, and every year, I, I reassess my whole 10, 3, 5, and 1 year, year goals from there. Um, so I am, I have a vision of what I want my life to look like. And I'm just trying to like narrow it down from like in my big, you know, at the end, what I want it to look like. And then am I living that today on a granular level? That's powerful, man. And I so admire your ability to like provide clarity for yourself and for your athletes. And I think it's these, these simple little things that you do, these exercises, these rituals that you have that continues to like hone your focus, right? When, before we start any of this type of stuff, we really don't know what matters to us. We don't know what's right. going on in our head. We don't know what our values are unless we take the time to think about it, to write about it, to explore it. And I think it just takes, and I'm, I'm, th this is like a clarity is a topic that I've thought about a lot more in the past year or two. And it, it just, it's a process. It, it is absolutely a process. Everything we is a learned just, skill, right? Including right. clarity. And it's, uh, to me, clarity is like, how clear is that voice in your head? Is it jumbled with a bunch of things that kind of like jumping from one thing to the next? And before you even get one kind of through one thought, it's on to the next thing, like, probably not a lot of clarity there. Are you distracted by everything else going on in your life or do you have really bright lines that you're steering your life towards? And to me, that only happens through 
you know, there's a couple of really good books out there about this, but like through solitude, through, um, um, you know, really, uh, becoming somewhat obsessed with, you know, what do I want out of my life? Mm-hmm. That type of stuff. And really that kind of questioning yourself about what is going to really make me happy. And those things change. What really made me happy when I was 18 was different than when I was 25, which is different than when I was 30, which is different than where I am now in my life, you know, and those things should change. So your purpose, this is the thing, Victor Frankl thing is like, your purpose is not a lifetime purpose. You were not put on life to do on earth to do one thing. You're put on earth to do one thing right now, today, Right. right now. What is your purpose right now, today? Go live that. And tomorrow it might be different. And that's totally fine. It doesn't need to be this one thing like blinders on, I'm steering like full speed ahead and everything else is a distraction because the universe is constantly changing. You're constantly changing. If you're not evolving and becoming a more learned, trained human being and more in home with yourself, like I think you're doing a disservice. Right. So kind of going along the same vein of commitment, and it's funny you said uh, training four to six hours earlier because I, the the example I have is someone training four to six hours. So there are tons of people in the in the fitness space that train four to six hours a day or more, and mm-hmm. they you know are quote unquote putting in the work, and they think that they really believe that they are fully committed. How is this different than what you're teaching? Um, so there's a couple sides to that. The first one is you know, it's the 10,000 hour rule, which the, the thing that's missed there is like, it's not about the hours. It's about deliberate, you know, it's Eric Erickson stuff, which is what Malcolm Gladwell left out when he talked about, you know, it's deliberate practice. Mm-hmm. You've been driving a car for 10,000 hours. Like you've been putting in the work. Why are you not, why are you not a professional race car driver? Mostly while texting though. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's because it's mindless. It's because yeah. it's not deliberate practice. You're not getting constant feedback on it. You're not super focused on it. It's not there to be, you're not doing it to be and to improve. Here's the biggest fault I see in our world in CrossFit is people put in the four to six hours, but every single time that they're all of those hours are with a fixed mindset. They're there judging themselves or am I good right now? Instead of taking a step back and being like, what is the right process I should be taking to make myself better at this? Mm -hmm. They don't practice. Few of them train. They're in there competing for four to six hours. It might not be against, you know, a leaderboard, but it's against the other person they saw on social media. It's where they are against where they saw some, they know somebody else can get 20 unbroken muscle ups. They only have nine. So they beat themselves up every single day because they're not there. It's this thought of like, I don't measure up. I'm still not there. And instead of thinking about what is the right process to be following, they're just going there and putting in the hours. And they're checking the box saying like, I did it. I worked out for four to six hours. I checked off everything on comp train, did it all. Instead of like, no, what are the real, what's a real way to make yourself better at this? And then from there, the real commitment, (laughs) um, the four to six hours is the easy part. Right. That's where it starts. Um, it's, it's, it's 24 hours. It's every piece. I mean, if you want to be, I train the best in the world. So if you want to be the best in the world, you know, the, the going to practice, it's like, that's like a high school kid being like, I don't know why these kids or other kids are getting better than me. I go to practice. I go to my team's practice. How is everybody else getting better than me? It's because practice is the bare minimum. What you do in the gym is your price of admission. Then from there, it's, your nutrition, your sleep, your recovery, your mindset. And what are you doing on, are you maximizing every single minute? And this is what world-class people do. They, 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 they morph their world to allow them the opportunities to pound on their craft at every single moment. Mm -hmm. Everything they do is to get better. When they choose entertainment, it's not entertainment for entertainment's sake. It's entertainment that can make them better. They're listening to podcasts or they're reading books or they're watching documentaries of people that are going to get them better at their craft. When they're, um, when they're spending time with their friends, they're making sure that it's 
um, either recuperative or it's doing things that are going to make them better. It's just like everything is centered around getting them towards their goals. So if you're going to the gym four to six hours a day and you're saying, I'm doing it, why am I still not in the top 200 in the open? There's, there's a lot more to dig into. The first part is deliberate practice and the mindset you're taking to those four to six hours. That has to be, I'm here to get better. I'm not here to compete and measure, measure up. It's not pass fail today. It is, I'm practicing. And what that means is I'm probably going to do worse today because if I'm just going to try and compete and measure myself on the leaderboard, then I'm going to do things with a, as much of a shortcut as possible. Mm -hmm. You might be decent at climbing a rope, but you have a, a terrible technique, but you've gotten fairly good at that terrible technique. If you're going to learn a more effective technique, when you're learning that, then that day you're going to perform worse. You're going to be slower at climbing a rope. That's okay. We need to be able to take that approach. You have to have the growth mindset of I'm doing this to get better at it. Well, my score today does not matter. We share the, uh, the example of breaking down Katrin's muscle up. Cause I think that's a really powerful example. You know, Katrin could do, I don't know, four muscle ups when, when she came to you. Yeah, she probably six. Yeah. Somewhere in like that six range was her max muscle ups. Um, still a games athlete and could do six muscle ups. And this is a, this is a few years ago. So, um, yeah, so she could do muscle ups, but she wasn't very good at them. So what a, what, as you said, like, um, what one athlete might do is I'm going to go there and I'm just going to go to the gym and train four to six hours a day. What a more professional approach might be is let's dissect us as an athlete. And what are our weaknesses? What are the harsh realities that are holding us back? You suck at muscle ups. Like we're, we're really bad at them. Okay. So we have a couple approaches here. We could just take an approach where we just pound them and pound them and pound them and pound them. And we're going to do 75 to 150 muscle ups a week for a year. That's a, that's not a bad approach. Like, but let's not kid ourselves. If you're going to, if you're like, I'm not good at muscle ups, I'm not good at muscle ups. And you're like, why am I not getting better at muscle ups? Until you can show me that you've done a hundred muscle ups a week for 50 weeks, let's not talk about it. Put in the work. Step one. Then step two is maybe a little bit more um, elaborate, maybe a little bit more detailed, is let's break it down. And what is the missing step in the muscle up? And for us, we found out, it, it, we, we rebuilt it. So I didn't have her do any muscle ups at all for a month. During that month, all we did was hanging kip swings, where she would literally go from arch to arch to hollow, arch to hollow, arch to hollow. And she did that to the point where we could build up to 10 sets of 10. Once we got 10 sets of 10 that looked, not just 10 sets of 10, but 10 sets of 10 where every rep looked the way we wanted to, and we videoed them and we broke them down, put them in slow motion. Then after a month of that, we went to one muscle up. And if that one muscle up, we had it where it was with a nice arch to hollow and we were able to do it the way we wanted to look, then we would do a second muscle up and we did it in a controlled environment. Never, it took us, I think three or four months before we put them in workouts. We had to rebuild it. So we rebuilt it. So we went the opposite approach. We rebuilt it, you know, um, from the ground up dedicated, you know, with, with deliberate, deliberate practice, everything is about getting better and you don't get to compete in muscle ups for six months. You don't get to compete. Um, and now what we're doing is the other approach. Now that we feel good about our technique, we're going to do 75 a week, mm -hmm. literally. And that's kind of what we're doing. Love it. And it takes a setting aside of the ego big time to be able to do this. Huge. Yeah. If and that's, so here's where we go back to the character right? If you don't have the character to set aside your ego, we can't get you to compete at your highest level. It all starts with, you're exactly right. You have to have the humility to be able to say, yes, I'm not good at muscle ups. You have to have the coachability to say, show me a good, better way. You have to have the persistence to be able to say, I'm going to follow through on this process. It's, it all comes back to the character traits. If you have too much of an ego, none of this is going to work. 
you have a chapter in your book on control. And I, I'm not sure if you wrote about it in the book or not, but I, kn I know I saw it on social media at some point. Before, before one year at the games, you had your athletes write down 101 things that could go wrong at the games that are outside mm -hmm. of their control. Can you explain the reasoning behind this and uh, the whole concept of what's inside and outside of your control? Yeah. So this is, um, this is, we used to start the conversation off with stoic philosophy. This is like the heart of stoic philosophy, which is control, you know, focus on the things that you have control over and everything else just ignore. It's gone. Like it, you can't give any sort of, um, thoughts to it or anything else because you're just wasting your time. You know, it's people that complain about the weather or the traffic they're sitting in, or somebody bumps into them on the train, and spills their coffee on them. Like once it's happened, dude, like, guess what? It's over. No matter how much you freak out about it, you're not going to change it. So what we wanted to do is leading into the games, I had my athletes write down everything we could possibly think of that could go wrong. So things like um, their alarm doesn't go off to um, they're um, not where they want to be on the leaderboard to um, um, workouts, the movements that they don't like pop up to it's really hot to they don't have the right foods. You get it. Like we listed 101 things. Um, from there we went through the list and said, okay, which of, which of these things do we have absolutely no control over? And which of these things do we have control over? And what we found was most of them had the kind of, were kind of, some of them we had no control over. One of the things on there was like Katrin put on there was a shark attack. Like, <laughs> like, yeah, if a shark's going to attack you, like, guess what? A shark's going to attack you. Now that we know that, like, there's nothing we can do. Forget about it. It's gone. It's like, it's not going to happen. But things like your alarm not going off. Okay, like your alarm goes off. There, you're like, I, there's nothing we could have done about that. Like, well, is there or isn't there? So we're like, I think there is. I think we can take control over that. So let's set two or three alarms. And we do that. A couple like backup systems to things like, um, um, we tried to, the baseline, not, we don't need to itemize them and go through them line by line. But the idea is let's figure out what we can take ownership of, what we can control, if we control it in any way, let's take everything we can in a proactive manner beforehand to make sure these things happen. Then from there, let's talk through the scenario. If these things do show up, like you're in, you're not where you want to be on the leaderboard. Okay. If you're not where you want to be on the leaderboard going into day three, what's going to be the most What's going to be our approach? What's going to be your mindset going into that? If you want to be in the top five throughout the whole weekend, of course you do. Everyone does, right? But let's say you are in the bottom five going into day three. What's going to be your approach? What do you want me to say to you that day? And beforehand, we're queuing it up. And then guess what? On that day, when we get in that scenario, we have a plan for that scenario. This idea of like control, we control and forget everything else is not like, well, it's outside of my control. You have to take ownership of things and plan for them beforehand. And if you say like, I'm not on the leaderboard, so I can't control this. And like, it sucks. And also it's like, let's plan it out beforehand. Everything. And if truly, if we can't control it, then push aside. Shark attacks, lightning strike. I get it. But it's going to be 120 degrees there. We can prepare for that. Let's make sure we have the electrolytes. Let's make sure we've done the heat exhaustion training beforehand. Let's make sure we have the hydration. Let's make sure we have the right cooling mechanisms afterwards. Let's make sure all those things. So we're going to put all those things in place. Confidence is being prepared mm -hmm. and knowing the difference between what you can control and what you can't. When you are prepared and you know what truly you cannot control, what else is there to freak out about? The idea behind this is can you do something about it? Yes. Okay. Good. Don't complain. Okay. Can you do something about it? No. Okay. Good. Don't complain. <laughs> it's like the same. It's like it comes back to the same thing. So if you ask yourself, can you do something about it? If you can, go and do that. Right. If you can't, let it go. Let it go. Doesn't serve you. What exactly. are a couple of the big ones that you see either athletes that you work with or clients that hold them back in their performance or their life? Mindset, you know, uh, having, you know, uh, this is full circle, Mike, because, uh, you and Adi actually recommended to Heather, my wife, the book mindset mm -hmm. by, um, is it Carol Dweck? Is that yep. mindset? Yeah. Um, so I read it. Um, so it comes back to that. If you don't have a growth mindset, 
you're done. It's, it's, it's done. Like you, you have to have the thought process that I can get better and I can improve. Mm -hmm. I can get, I can, I can make this better. If you don't have that, if it's a, she has talent and I don't, or that's why he's better at this because God granted that person with more innate abilities than I have. Like, sorry, like there's not a lot I can help you out with. Once you have a growth mindset and if you add in that humility and hunger, like that is a pretty dangerous combination. Mm -hmm. I hear so many of the the people that have a fixed mindset out there thinking in, in a very fixed minded way, well, I guess I'm fucked. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily for you, the, the anyone can develop a growth mindset and it's simply the way to do it is simply by becoming aware of the areas of your life in which you are being fixed minded. And the faster you can become aware of fixed minded thinking in the moment, the faster you're going to develop a growth mindset and start taking action consistent with someone with a growth mindset, period. Love it, Mike. Love it. So my last question, and then we I have a few rapid fires for you. You said somewhere that there's the event itself and then there's the story that we tell ourselves about what the event means so there's the event it the event itself and then there's the story about what it means what do you mean by this so i i think that there's um there's a few things this so its idea is um this is kind of wrapped into a, a way to make change in people's lives right and way to like achieve your goals and all that stuff and um the, what you tell yourself about, it's the perspective you bring to things, right? So, um, and it's a really powerful thing. This is kind of Tony Robbins type stuff, but um, if you're trying to make change in your life, um, if you want to get better at muscle ups or you want to grow a business, there's a certain strategy you can take to that. And that's the this first S. And you can follow, um, you know, if you're trying to get uh, a linear progression, you could do volume training, you could get a gymnastic coach. There's a whole bunch of different strategies you could take. The strategies you take are less important. Those are the events are less important than the story you're telling yourself about those events. The story is more important. And the story is, are you telling yourself, I'm on the right track. I'm making gains. I'm getting better. I have, I can, if I continue on this path, I'm going to get exactly what I want out of this. That's a lot different than, you know, imagine this scenario where you have two athletes following the exact same programming. One's telling themselves like, I'm working my ass off and I'm not getting anywhere. The other athletes telling themselves like, I'm working my ass off. And although I haven't seen the gains yet, I know that this is the right path. Mm -hmm. Like it's really clear who's going to get better. It's all about the story we tell ourselves about the events that are occurring. It's not necessarily the events that are occurring. So the same state, it's like um, um, Katrin at the games. The year, the second year she won, the first day of the games, they got the athletes on a plane, flew them up to Northern California, had them perform three events. The plane was delayed on the way back. They didn't get any sleep. They came back at midnight. They had to pack and prepare for a 5 a.m. wave call the next day. Next six day, they go to the beach and do another event right away. And you can tell yourself two different stories to that. One is, I got to sleep. I got three hours of sleep last night. Or you could tell yourself like, oh my God, I only got three hours of sleep last night. There's literally, we have footage of Katrin saying, um, she was asked, like, tell me about your experience so far at the game. She's like, it was amazing. Got to go up, we got to go to Aromas and compete in these events. And um, last night I was able to sleep in the airport and I slept on the plane. And uh, like, she's literally sleeping like, like on her luggage in like the waiting area and there's footage of people like mm -hmm. boarding a plane walking over her. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's not like she's getting restful sleep, but she's telling herself, I got to sleep. Whereas other athletes are like, this is terrible. I'm not rested. I'm not sleeping. I'm not, everyone's in the same boat. You know, what's the story you're going to tell yourself? Are you going to take this really negative view of it, which is going to lead to more negativity? It's the secret, right? That book that was out years ago, like what you put out to the universe, you get more of. If you put out there that you're 
tired, that you're sore, that you're, you can't compete at this level. You're not going to be able to. You're telling yourself that story. But if you take a perspective that's different, the outcome is going to be different. What an enormous competitive advantage it is for one. So for Katrin in that scenario to just have this feeling of thriving and being at her best and like she's not missing anything versus all of the people that are feeling like they're not going to perform well, they're, they don't yeah. do well without sleep and, and just operating from a, from a sense of scarcity and, um, just having less than, than they need. You know what that is? So that's not a light switch that gets flipped at the games. Yep. And it's certainly not her lying to herself. That is us together training that for three years mm -hmm. where she is not allowed to say a complaint. So what that forces her to do is look on the silver lining of everything. And when it gets to the games, all she sees is silver linings when everyone else sees the gray and the black. Mm -hmm. That's awesome, it's, man. It's, it, it's honed, it's trained, it's forged, it's created. It's not something anyone's born with. Right. That's not who Katrin was when she started training with us. When she started training with us, she had emotional tantrums and we trained it out of her. Now, the credit all goes to her because she is the best student I've ever been with, ever. Like she learns things better than anybody. So I put this out to a lot of my athletes. She's just the one that happened to grasp onto it and take it and then run with it on her own. Right. That's killer. Okay. What book have you given most as a gift or recommended most? Mm, probably the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey. <laughs> Get out of here. I, I interviewed Mike Boyle earlier and he said the exact same one. Huh. Funny. Yeah. It's just, it's the book that I read at the right time in my life. Um, you know, as I was transitioning into being a coach and an entrepreneur and, um, it resonated so well with me that it's created the foundation of everything that, you know, every other thing I've read since is just paraphrasing that. Yeah. It's the synopsis. It is the core tenets of how to become effective person. What's a belief that you hold that if others held would have the biggest, uh, effect on their performance or life in general? Hmm. Um, enjoy it now. Don't wait. Uh, I mean, if people put more emphasis on the enjoyment of the process, that's really where the magic is. It's not about the end destination. It's not about the reward. It's not about the carrot or the trophy or the accolades at the end. It's about the day to day. It's about enjoying the grit and the grind. It's enjoying uh, the early wake up calls. Because when you get back to the end of it and you have that celebratory party, if you do get the awards, accolades, trophy or carrot, what you're going to do is you're going to reminisce about the hardships along the way. Mm -hmm. That's what it's all about. You know, when people get out of the military, what they talk about is the hardest training sessions in the military. It's understanding that those moments that everyone else is hating is they are the best times. It's when I, we have training sessions and they're hard. I would put them up against, they're hard. They're really, <laughs> really hard training sessions. The hardest ones are the ones in the middle of it we look at each other and we're like, this is one of them. This is one of these ones at the end of the year, we're going to look back and call out this day. This is one of those days yep. when it's easy. We don't, we, we never talk like that. It's just, you know, no one gets to the end of the road and they look back at the easy days or the mediocre days. They look back at the hardest days. Well, enjoy those hardest days in the moments because those are right. the ones that are the most effective. And it's all about what, where your focus is, right? Is your focus out on the horizon or is it yeah. right in the here and now? Right. What's an action that you think people should take immediately? Um, tell people that you care about that you care about them. I think people are <laughs> um, have a tendency to become uh, complacent in their closest, most meaningful relationships mm -hmm. and give give near strangers, not, I'm not talking strangers, but people that they sort of know more compassion. 
Right. You know, they give them more manners. They give them more patience, more politeness. They give them more courtesy. You know, you go out to dinner with people that you barely know and everyone's on their best behavior. But you go and have dinner at the family dinner table and people are short-tempered and I think it's giving people that you love the most the most. That's phenomenal advice. And I don't think it's, again, I don't think that advice is just to make the world a better place, but it's also to make your life a better life. Expressing yeah. gratitude and contributing to other people is what makes this is life one of the living. habits in the seven habits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. It's dude. really, that's what they, they talk about that. It's like, if you want to have more, if you want your spouse to love you more, love them more. Right. Like if you, if, if you and your spouse and there's, are, are going through a rough patch, the worst thing you can do is focus on your spouse's weaknesses or what they're doing. Cause what you can do is you, the more you focus on the more you're going to pull them to light. Yep. Instead, think about the love and the gratitude and all, all the things you just mentioned and bring those to life and Give them the compassion and the caring that they deserve. And if you give that back, it's yeah. the secret again. The more you give back to it, the more you give, the more you'll get back. Yeah. Ah, that's great advice, man. That's all I've got, dude. This has been phenomenal. Guys, if you haven't read or listened to Ben's book yet, Chasing Excellence, it's phenomenal. He has a lot of, every every single chapter has very vivid stories that teach each lesson in the book. Each one of the chapters is is some big knowledge bomb, mostly on mindset and behavior. And it's just phenomenal. Whether you want to be a better athlete or live a better life, pick it up. Ben, what, what do you have going on right now that you want people to know about? I know you just released the training IQ. Can you tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about that? Yeah. So training IQ is, um, it's a, uh, weightlifting, um, program and we created a pretty snazzy app to go along with it. Um, and the app is basically like a world class lifting coach in your pocket. So it's the first thing I've seen of the sort. It's actually smart. So it's like learning technology. It will learn you as an athlete. So the more data you give it, the more specific the criteria it spits back to you. So it is um, designed by myself and another world-class Olympic lifting coach, actually a couple of them. Um, and basically the premise is it's to improve your clean and jerk, your snatch, your strength. There's also a conditioning piece to it. And as you start to input data, it'll really quickly know just from your baseline numbers, it'll spit back to you. Okay. Relative to the numbers we have, it looks like you are more of a strength athlete and you can work more on your technique and it will give you programming to work more on your technique or the vice versa. looks like from your numbers, your technique is very good. looks like you need to work more on your strength mm -hmm. or your clean relative to your jerk relative to your snatch is in these ratios. It looks like we should be spending a little more extra time on your jerk right. or whatever it might be. From there, the more data you put in, it learns you up until the point where it'll actually, um, if you're trying to peak for a competition, it'll taper for that competition for you. If you're trying to um, achieve a certain goal, it'll help you achieve that goal. So something we're really proud of, um, it's a smart algorithm-based um, technology that you have as, a, as a, on your smartphone that can guide you through um, your strength stuff. One of the things I'm excited about is a lot of people follow a brute training thing or my training thing or, um, you know, comp train or whatever, or their own. And they're like, I'm just like, they get better conditioning and their numbers are moving a little bit every year and they're gaining that 5%, but so is the field. So they go from a, um, you know, two years ago they had a 205 pound snatch and this year they have a 215 pound snatch mm -hmm. and next year they're going to have a 225 pound snatch. You're never going to crack into the next level because the whole field is progressing the same as you. What this app is, what this program is in place for is to give you, specifically you, a world-class coach to get you to get the big jump, right. to get the major gains in the weightlifting. What we're saying is if you want the major gains, if you want to put the 30 pounds, if you want to put the 50 pounds on your lifts, let's do this. Yep. That's the idea. Badass, man. Where do they find yeah. it? Uh, online or on? TrainingIQ.com. Got yep. it. Trainingiq.com. Yep. That's cool. Uh, 
it made me think of, this is such a tangent, but it made me think of, I was just listening to someone talk about AI and yeah. where we are with AI right now. There's a, a program that can write fiction books at a, I want to say a fifth grade level, completely generated by a computer. Oh my God. So if a computer can write a fifth grade fiction, it can definitely get your snatch and clean and jerk up guys. That's right. Yeah. Love it. That's awesome, man. <laughs> Um, as always, uh, they can find you at Ben Bergeron. Is there anything? Yeah, I'm Ben Bergeron everywhere. I'm Ben Bergeron.com. I'm Ben Bergeron on Instagram. Um, yeah, project elevation is another one of my projects, but yeah, that's, if you go to Ben Bergeron.com, you'll probably get the right places. Awesome, man. Thanks again. This was great. Thanks, Mike. This episode is finished, but your training journey continues. Head over to BruteStrengthTraining.com slash SSW and grab your free pack of 32 accessory workouts that you can incorporate into your training and start improving your strength immediately. That's BruteStrengthTraining.com slash SSW.